I'm going to begin with an apology and I'll explain to you, but it perfectly sets up what I want to talk about today. When you read the description for this jumpstart, you're going to find out that something that happened when the filming of the original Planet of the Apes took place is a great metaphor for race and how we interact with other people. Unfortunately, because Miroslav lives in Serbia, he does not understand how charged it would be to put a picture, uh, the word race, and then put a picture of a chimp. Now, even though I'm gonna talk about the movie Planet of the Apes and the fact about chimps and things like that in just a moment. Miroslav didn't do that. And when I saw it this morning, I went, oh my gosh, because I thought that just, that just, I saw Ellen last night crying after trying to console people. So I realized this morning that I am trying to juggle fire and gasoline by even addressing what it is I'm going to address. I, however, cannot sit silently by as things unfold, and I also want to share with you my perspective and give you some things to think about. That's really all I want to do. So, here's how all of this ties into the movie Planet of the Apes. When the original Planet of the Apes movie was made with Charlton Heston, I think it was 67, if I'm not mistaken. Now, when that movie was made, the directors made a decision that they were not going to have any uh, masks. They were not going to have any chimp masks or gorilla masks or orangutan masks. If someone was to appear on camera, they were going to be in full prosthetic makeup. Now, back, back then, they used latex, it was heavy, it was hot, and it took about six hours per actor to get them made up. So, We've got every actor who is on screen is gonna to have to go through this long, laborious process. Well, I heard an interview with Roddy McDowell, who played Cornelius, the lead chimp and the star of the movie, and he talked about something he saw that was very interesting. Now, remember the time frame in which this was going on. There was a big scene one day where there was hundreds of extras employed, and that meant hundreds of a combination of chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans, okay? Gorillas, chimpanzees, and orangutans. And so they had to go through this long, long six hour process. They literally built a conveyor belt. They say that it's not a conveyor belt, but they did an assembly line where the prosthetics were applied on one person, then they would move to another person, somebody else would come around and smooth it out, etc. They said you couldn't make movies back then because you couldn't get anyone to do makeup. So, what Roddy McDowell noticed was when these hundreds of extras showed up, they did what people tend to do, I guess. And that is that there was a mixture of Caucasian actors, African-American actors, Asian-American actors, and Latino actors. And he noticed that they tended to hang around by race. They tended to um, to, to gather by race in their conversations as they smoked cigarettes, had drinks, and waited to go through the process of being converted into a character for the movie. And he noticed that, like I said, people tended to be drawn together based on, on race. I'm not going to get too much into that, but I, I think you'll understand why in just a moment. After they went through the process, this assembly line, and then came out the other end. Now, mind you, the actors were all mixed up, okay? It wasn't like all the uh, Asian actors were turned into, were made into gorillas or, or, or orangutans or chimpanzee. They were, it was random. It was totally random. And when they came out the other side, Roddy McDowell noticed that the gorillas tended to congregate together, the orangutans congregated together, and the chimpanzees congregated together. What I'm trying to say is that there is a natural thing about human beings wanting to cluster together based on similar experiences, similar ethnicity as well. However, all of this is to set up, I think, probably an enormous however. I think we are blind to what it's like to be a member of another race. I think we are blind because we don't experience the treat we. I'd, I see the challenge I have here is I don't want to speak for all of you 
because I know I have a lot of people of various ethnicities who are watching. So I think I'm just going to use I. I don't know the experiences of other people. I know what happens when I get pulled over by a police officer, but I sure don't know what happens when someone of a different uh, ethnicity gets pulled over by a police officer. <sighs> However, again, with all the things that are going on, there is one thing that is undeniable. And that is there is a systemic racism issue in some police departments, if not several, if not many. And that is something that needs to be addressed immediately and needs to be changed going forward. I want to see this as a watershed moment. I don't want us to ever come back here again. And I know you don't either. I want to tell you a little bit about my history real quick, if I may, and just bear with me. And I, it may or may not surprise you. One of the things I discovered about, I think about race is that none of us ever believes we are a racist. Again, I'm trying to talk mostly and pre predominantly for myself. I know my father was a racist, but he never would believe he was a racist. The term racist never applied to him. I know a lot of people I would consider racist, but they never considered themselves racist. I want to show you an image that I've never shown publicly before. This was taken in approximately 1967. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger here for you. Let that sink in for just a moment. The man in blackface is my father, Bill Bowen. That's my mom. We were at the minstrel show that my father's association put on every year. Now, was this put on hidden in the shadows? No. And this was right during the civil rights movement of the 1960s. This was not put on in a private venue or anything like this. This was in the township auditorium in Columbia, South Carolina. Now, who was in this minstrel show? Not only my father, who was the executive vice president of the South Carolina, uh, South Carolina Savings and Loan League, which was an association of savings and loans, which ultimately became morphed and assumed by banks predominantly. But prior to then, if you wanted to get a home loan, you went to a savings and loan. Banks did not really do that. Banks were more commercially focused. So my father was the executive director of this association. The other cast of this minstrel show were the presidents of all the savings and loans, the people who had ultimate authority over who got a house and who didn't get a house. I look at this now and I shared this with my daughter Leah because I wanted her to know some of the, we all have a history. I wanted her to know some of that history. And she was absolutely shocked how accepted this was. And again, not a single one of these men considered them racist. But as we look at it today, we know it to be true. We know it to be very, very true. My mother never discussed race with me, neither did my dad. It was not something that was discussed because we were around white people. I was never around an African-American person. Uh, I played with, with, with African-American kids in the park. I know that when I went to the park by myself, I would play a lot with African-American kids. We'd ride bikes and skateboards and stuff like that, but never socially. My parents never knew or were with African-Americans. And whenever my mom would drive through a predominantly African-American neighborhood, she would reach over and click to uh, lock the doors in the car because we didn't have an automatic door lock. My great-grandfather, who um, my mother adored and who has been celebrated as a lawyer, also bears the distinction of writing the treatise for the Methodist Church that was adopted nationwide. I forget when. It would have been in the early 1900s. 
saying that African American people do not have souls and therefore should not be allowed in the Methodist Church. So, this is my history, my family's history, and I'll let you in on one more thing. My dad was not the only person in that minstrel show. I was. At the very end, they demanded to meet the author of this terrible, the script did, called for the characters to demand to see the author of the terrible script. It was a sort of a reflection of a reflection. And they had me dressed up, I was seven years old as a little boy, to come out licking a big lollipop. I tried to find that picture. So, it starts very, very young. It starts innocently and it starts as normal. And then it becomes normalized in our own minds and in our own hearts. The thing I love about the story I began with about the Planet of the Apes is that inside the people were all the same. They never changed. When they put on the prosthetic makeup and they moved from being one person to being a character under all the makeup and yet still were drawn to similar characters, inside they were all the same. Inside they were all the same. I want to plug a podcast. It's called The Daily. It's put out by the New York Times. I listen to it every day. And I listened to it last week, and last week it was particularly good because it explained why it's so difficult to get rid of police officers such as the man who murdered George Floyd. I don't want to say his name. But the man who murdered George Floyd had had, I think it was 19 prior claims against him, and yet he continued to come back. And the mayor can fire police officers, but often there's a review board that's often internal that allows them to come back. And the head of the police union in Minneapolis has already called for all four officers to come back to work. Something is broken. Something needs to be fixed. So in all of this, I want us to understand that inside, we're all the same. There's no difference between us. And the more that we open our hearts and minds to people who have different experiences and trust their experiences. I was thinking this morning, now since the Me Too movement, I think we take the experiences women report a lot more seriously. God, I hope we do. And going forward, if a police officer kills an African-American man, we take it real seriously or any person. However, a lot of the deaths, a disproportionate number, take place against African Americans. One more thing I want to close with, and then I want to read your comments. Did you know there was no police in the South for the first couple hundred years, which is where I'm from and where I live now? What they did instead was they deputized every single white male landowner as a law officer to look for uh, black people and uh, to try and ascertain whether they were free or whether they were escaped slaves. And if they were escaped slaves, they could be taken back into custody and oftentimes they were taken into custody even if they weren't. Point I'm trying to make is that there has never been a really good relationship between the police and the African American community. Many have tried, but it's time we all try. It's time we vote for people who are going to make changes, who are going to break police departments apart, stand in the face of criticism and make things different. And we need to support and love everyone. Huh, let me read what you all are saying. Miyuki's here. Uh, Michelle is here. Good morning. Oh, wow, says Will. Lisa gives me some applause. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story, says Cynthia. Theodius Teddius Barris, such a cute name. That's what I call him, Theodosius Teddy Barris. Love the daily. Thank you for addressing this. Thanks for speaking up. Glad to hear and see you, Will Blake Hughes. Blake, it's good to hear from you. Blake used to play the band in which uh, Jerome Johnson uh, also performed with us. 
There's a lot to unpack in this episode today. And believe me, I wanted to go a lot farther. The thing I would do is to invite you to understand that I actually listened to this song this weekend from the Broadway show because I had so much on my mind as I was thinking about what to say today. Everyone's a little bit racist from Avenue Q. Everyone's a little bit racist from Avenue Q. It's, um, it's a song and uh, it talks about the fact that we are not only all a little bit racist, we're blind to it. And what we need to do is to become way more aware of it. And that includes myself, and I'm constantly working on it. Will said, oh wow, so transparent, that took courage. Can I tell y'all something? My hands are shaking. My hands have been shaking all morning as I've been preparing this. But I think it's important that we discuss it. I love you all. We are gonna be live in complaint-free meditation so that I can become still and my hands can stop shaking. And I look forward to being with you again tomorrow. Bless you all. Thank you. Have a wonderful Monday. And enjoy today. And I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank you.